Welcome to Occult of Personality, esoteric podcast extraordinaire at occultofpersonality.net. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. Occult of Personality podcast is available on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, Acast, and all the best podcast apps. This is episode 173, featuring an interview with Amadali. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to the Occult of Personality membership section, and our patrons who participate via the Occult of Personality Patreon campaign. Although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge, the costs to produce it are significant. Your financial contributions ensure the continuity of the free podcast. Please support a Cult of Personality podcast by joining the membership section or donating via the donate button on the occultofpersonality.net website or via Patreon at patreon.com slash occultofpersonality. Our Patreon page now features an exclusive RSS feed for patrons, meaning that if you subscribe via Patreon to support the show, you will get some content just for you. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks, and I salute you. A Cult of Personality podcast is also sponsored by Miskatonic Books, an online store that focuses on the esoteric, occult, ceremonial magic, Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, witchcraft, the Golden Dawn, as well as dark fantasy, classic horror, and supernatural fiction. They carry books by all your favorite esoteric publishers as well. Just visit MiskatonicBooks.com. Temple of Thelema is a true outer order of the greater mysteries, providing ceremonial initiation, structured training, and regular group work, all in conformity with the principles of the Book of the Law. An investment of time, effort, and commitment is expected from each member. Each is expected to aspire fervently to the great work, to dare, with courage undaunted, to perfect that work and ever to apply his or her best effort to effect harmony within the order and within the world in general. Founded in service to the AA, College of Thelema seeks to guide the student to an understanding of the law of Thelema. Most especially, this means a deeper understanding of oneself and of one's true will. A combination of instruction techniques is employed, including seminars, written texts, and individual work. For over 40 years, College of Thelema has published journals in the Continuum and Black Pearl, as well as several books on occult subjects maintaining high standards in Thelemic education. Visit Temple of Thelema at www.thelema.org. Now, in episode number 173, I'm absolutely thrilled to bring you this extensive interview with the one and only Amadali. You can find her online at amadali.com. Amadali is an artist, musician, writer, and magician from the UK who has produced an extensive body of work spanning over 30 years, specializing in research on the sexual mysteries of Babylon and the metaphysics and phenomenology of female occult anatomy. Amadali's research is accompanied by in-depth complementary praxis, and her multidisciplinary body of work has manifested internationally through ritual performances, album releases, art exhibitions, and public lectures. She has initiated extensive investigation into the magical dimensions of sound and vocal expression, 
movement, trance techniques, sexuality, and their relationship with female subtle architecture. Her interpretation of the magic of 156 is based on a personal practice which has been characterized by the negotiation and mastery of extreme sexual trance states, which she describes as a form of physical scrying. She has found this direct form of ecstatic gnosis to be a distinctive characteristic of direct possession by Babylon. An introduction to her magical system is featured in the essay Introductory Theoria on Progressive Formulas of the Babylon Priestesshood, as part of the Three Hands Press anthology published in 2015 entitled A Rose Veiled in Black, an extensive synthesis of her magical practice, The Marks of Teth, will be published by Three Hands Press in 2017. Amidali, I want to welcome you to the podcast. It's really an honor and a pleasure to speak with you this evening. Hi, Greg. Uh, thanks for asking me. I'm, I'm really happy to be here speaking with you. Uh, thank you. So tonight we're going to be speaking about your work uh, generally, but specifically uh, you have an essay included in the wonderful book, A Rose Veiled in Black, Arcana and Art of Our Lady Babylon, published by Three Hands Press. And your, your essay is entitled Introductory Theoria on Progressive Formulas of the Babylon Priestesshood. And uh, it's really wonderful, wonderful essay. And um, maybe before we begin talking about that, we can talk a little bit about you yourself. And um, if you could tell us how you became interested in the esoteric, and what's your background with regard to study, practice, organizations, etc.? Yep, for sure, yeah. Um, I guess like a lot of people who became, become interested in the occult, I had some experiences in my youth that seemed to make a, a, an indelible impression on me that were quite strange. But for me, it was I discovered that I had a kind of ability to enter into trance states and it used to happen fairly often. And I guess as I approached puberty, it started to get more intense. But I found that I could activate different parts of my body that seemed, it seemed to be a kind of a magical activation um, that I did through, through touch. And when I was experimenting with it, I would see lights and strange presences. And then I started to get a sense of doorways or portals opening up around me. Um, and I discovered that the more I experimented um, with different types of touch, um, I could kind of propel my awareness through these these portals. And it was all kind of un unfathomable to me. I didn't really understand exactly what I was doing, and I had absolutely no context for it. But what it did was it, it kind of gave me a sense of great mystery about sexual energy. You know, there was something very unfathomable fathomable and mysterious about it and it was something that I felt really drawn to and I, I kind of knew instinctively that that's what I wanted to um, follow in my life. There was something very, very deeply mysterious there that I wanted to know more about. I wanted to know its substance and what it, what it really was. So that, from, from there, I guess I got sidetracked in a way. My early childhood was I went to um, a Catholic convent school, which wasn't exactly positive experience mm. um, and that kind of gave me a very atheistic view on the world so I was kind of conflicted for a long time between these experiences that I was having that were deeply strange and seemed inherently very mysterious and unfathomable and the kind of rational attitudes were, which were shaped by my upbringing. It took a while before I actually took the plunge and actually started a magical practice and started to explore more deeply when I got to my late teens and early 20s, I started a more structured practice. So I started using basic Western ceremonial techniques, studying tarot and Kabbalah. I was meditating. I was in lots of bands at the time, uh, doing music and lots of sexual experimentation, using psychedelics. So it was quite a kind of heady brew that I was <laughs> mixing up there. Mm. And I started creating very simple kind of practices where I'd get the, the Crowley's 
tarot deck and um, I'd use the major arcana and I'd use those as portals to kind of project myself through in a similar way that I'd, I'd kind of done when I was younger but in a much more focused way and I started to get lots of results with that and the trance states that I'd experienced when I was younger it all came back but a thousand fold mm. stronger and as I carried on with that um, Babylon started to appear in the workings and it, it all just took on a, a really very powerful momentum that just kind of carried on really into lots of strange directions but that's, that's kind of it really in essence you know it's like those early trance states and that sense of a, a border space that you can permeate with sexual energy that was something that just really want, felt drawn to that's what was important to to explore it's fascinating just as an aside um, as you were describing that uh Basically, I was, felt like I was starting to go into a trance state myself. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, you know, I had a similar reaction when I was um, interviewing um, Alan Greenfield years ago. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Yes, which for, for reasons I'm sure you, you understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should probably talk about later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, let me know. <laughs> yeah. If anything else that manifests. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's all it, it all kind of came from those basic practices, and, and once once Babylon had started to appear, it all just really unraveled really really quickly. Um, I started to experience lots of kind of extreme what could be called kind of Kundalini phenomena, and the trances became really quite unmanageable. It was very very violent, very um, very hard to manage because I just didn't have any context you know for what was happening there, mm-hmm. there really wasn't much this is the pre-internet day so there were, apart from the kind of standard magical texts that were around at the time there was really very little that i could go on so i just had to trust my own inner kind of instincts about what was happening and uh try and follow it through wow that is intense i can't imagine many people uh have a, such like a visceral experience of it because it, you know, you're talking about, from my estimation, like the penultimate, like hallmarks of like magical practice or experience in general, which is the spirit deity contact. And then, you know, these Kundalini trance states, which, you know, like you mentioned, are virtually impossible to manage in any way. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's this almost immediately as I started my practice, I started to come against lots of barriers, you know, in terms of how to construct the whole thing and how to work with it. Because kind of traditionally, to follow an esoteric pattern in an authentic way, it's usually defined as being built from a kind of mixture of instruction from a teacher um, or an initiate um, from any kind of given tradition and mixing that with your own personal practice but you've got a kind of benchmark for your progress but there was just nothing like that that I I could refer to because my work was based on direct contact with Babylon without any kind of mediation by a teacher or a male partner or an established sex magical system it was kind of well what do I do you know do I give up on this you know do I do I just kind of write it off as as being some kind of crazy fantasy that's, that's running away with itself or do I do I actually trust what's going on and and try to build something around it. But as time went on, it just, the things that were coming through in the trance states just became much kind of more nuanced. The phenomenon was more nuanced. The kind of information that I was getting was became more complex. And it seemed to have a kind of integrity in itself mm-hmm. that made sense. So I just had to keep going with it, basically, because I just felt like it was important just to kind of carry it through. I just decided to, I, to just to throw myself into it and, and see where it led. But at the time, I'd no idea that it was going to be a process of like was coming up to nearly 30 years now and I still don't feel like I've even begun to scrape the surface of the of what's possible and the potential within it all because it feels like a whole new body of knowledge that's only just starting to be formulated in some ways because of the position of women so it's well, it's not just me. Obviously, there's lots of other women who are working in a similar direction. Um, so it's a really interesting time, you know, to be to be doing all this, you know, because it feels like certain barriers are being broken down, you know, that new 
types of practice can can start to evolve. It's, it's I have no idea where it's going to go, but I just have to keep going with it, basically. Yeah, it's fascinating. I I think you're right. I think it is really really interesting, and uh, I think you deserve a lot of credit for working with this and really bringing forth. I think things that are new or seem new, but maybe they're based on you know something that is beyond new or old. Not many people would have the fortitude to do what you've done and continue to do. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's, as, as I say, I felt like I didn't really have a lot of choice in, in the matter as, as it's gone along, but it's, it's become kind of increasing more, more difficult over time because as my own personal work became more evolved and more complex and, and working as a system within itself, it became more of a... Um, an entity on its own that that was outside of the kind of orthodox magical system. So the longer it's gone on, the harder it's been in a way to try and integrate it into mainstream ideas, you know, about what Babylon is or in terms of Thelema and uh, all the other tra- traditions associated with Babylon. But I just felt it was really important to follow that thread through of that direct contact to see see how that worked and what came through and then kind of evaluate it afterwards and, you know, and as I've gone along to see what, you know, what really felt important to, to carry through from it. It's also the aspect that there was no definitive transmitted text, which is, um, that's kind of a hallmark for, from the work of Crowley and, and Parsons and Dee, you know, is this whole pattern of, um, that the spirits come through and, and they deliver texts about the, the current, um, that they're representing. But in my case, it was, the information was coming through in a wholly kind of pretextual, kind of notice, a physical notice that was coming directly through the, the trance states. But that isn't to say that there, there wasn't a kind of system to it that emerged over time, but it was just very difficult to fit into context of, of a textual teaching. So I had to kind of think of other ways of expressing it. I think I got to more recent, more recent years, I got to the point where I felt like I could start to articulate it a lot better um, textually. But it took a lot of time to actually build through that whole kind of di- direct corporeal kinetic language that was coming through. Very interesting. And I think it actually is a perfect segue into the next question, which is, you know, basically, how would you summarize the 156 current in terms of uh, its definition and its history? So there's many historical threads that you can follow and that shed some light on the feminine sexual gnosis and the archaic sources of the 156. Um, and there's many, there's obviously many archetypes and goddesses and associated traditions which embody the kind of dynamic shaktiism and eroticism that, that people associate with Babylon. Um, and there's obviously the more direct influences and provenance from the biblical Babylon um, and her associations with Canaanite and Sumerian goddesses. But the problem is that what we know about these goddess traditions isn't really solid enough in terms of creating a basis for the kind of knowledge systems, sex magical knowledge systems that I've, I've felt, well, I found anyway, my own practice are really needed in this point in time. So I do look back and I do look, I've got a lot of ongoing historical research um, going on, but the kind of areas that I focused on is, and the kind of most direct provenance that I've found is in the the Enochian works of Dee through to Crowley. And this is, again, for purely personal reasons. The reason that I focus on is it's, a, it's the definition of Babylon as 156, which first emerges through the work of Dee. You get the word Babylon, that's B-A-B-A-L-O-N, appears, and then Crowley picked up on it later. And I found a lot of magical connections with this version of Babylon in, in ritual workings. And also the, the female spirits in the Enochian ethers seem to really resonate with what I experienced with Babylon in, in the transpossession work that I was doing. And also the word itself seemed to act as a, as a real gateway for this primal eros, the primal goddess, to manifest. So there was something really important about the, the word Babylon, the, the 156 um, version of it, not the biblical Babylon, that seemed to me to be a kind of crystallization that incorporated the earlier 
association of the biblical Babylon and all the archaic sex magical goddesses um, and also future aspects of the current as well. It seems to be a kind of pivotal crystallization where the energy could actually start to manifest. For me, that's where it became a starting point in the Western tradition where Babylon actually started to form um, from all those many threads of archaic roots actually started to appear and then began to take on a real momentum, which then appeared later in Crowley's work and Parsons and then as it's carried on to the present day. So to me, that's where I've focused a lot of my attention in terms of provenance for the current because it's, it's a direct magical provenance mm-hmm. um, rather than a, than a historical provenance that just works through, you know, in, 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 in reality and in practice. So it's, it, a lot of my practice in me has been built on it. So again, it's just a very personal interpretation, but that's where, for me, that's the starting point. And obviously, there's, you can find lots of inspirational material, you know, from historical sources as well mm. that give you an insight into female sex magic. Obviously, it's a it's a universal phenomenon. But in terms of Babylon, she's, she has some very specific attributes. And so I found that the best way of actually exploring those in a very technical way has come through working within the Enochian framework and the Enochian spirit. So yeah, that's that's kind of my angle on the whole thing, really. Yeah, I think that's crucial that you're, you know, drawing from the... Uh in Enochian working initially in modern manifestations of it, but it does give it historical context it, it, and magical context, as you mentioned, which may be more important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what, what I also find interesting is that the, the kind of period that, that straddled the lifetime of Dean Crowley also aligns with the era um, in the planetary heptarchic angelic progressions, which, which is defined as the Venusian age, mm-hmm. um, ruled by the Archangel Aniel, which is mentioned a lot in these these works. Um, so it seemed to me that there's this flowering of a, of a Venusian current that started in a very germinal sense in these work that gradually kind of permeated and percolated through until the conditions became ripe really for women to actually start to take on the physical attributions of the current and actually start to be able to, to manifest it. So for me, it's something that's unfolding and it's, it hasn't reached its conclusion. It's been something that seems to have just come out of that particular era, you know, and that, focused in that way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, um, this is really interesting. Um, in, in practice... The deities associated with the 156 Egregore initiates different aspects of the sexual mysteries of Babylon. For example, Galva, as I've worked with her in any case, um, corresponds to the primal mother who holds the templates of cosmic sexual intelligence on the inner planes. Isis holds the magic of what's categorized as the third garment, and Babylon represents the physical manifestation of all of these mysteries as they're expressed through flesh. So there's a whole whole different um, spectrum of energies that I work with that relates to female magical anatomy in the current. So the practices that are probably going to seem pretty unorthodox to people who are working with the Enochian system in a more traditional manner. But um, all I can say is it's, it's a sincere practice and it, it seems to have a technical consistency and it's producing results so um and ever more areas of research so as i as said earlier i'm not sure how it's going to be received but it might be of, of use to others who are pushing into those areas that haven't been explored very much so i very much agree with what you just said in terms of the historical context and narrative uh, in terms of like the development of society and what I would characterize as like the, 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 the recognition of individualism. Um, you know, it started out as ideas of like, you know, Renaissance humanism and mm-hmm. things of that nature, but now it's more blossomed into the idea of like, uh, you know, I'm an individual person and I can decide what I would like to do with my life. And yeah, these are yeah. all relatively recent 
things. I mean, the whole idea that, you know, you had a body that belonged to you and that you could decide what you wanted to do with it, that that's fairly recent, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah absolutely. And uh, that you could decide, you know, that you what you wanted to do in life. I mean, that's a very recent phenomena. And so I feel like these are really necessary conditions, I think, is what I'm searching for. Like, And mm, I think yeah. th these conditions are really – conducive to bringing about this type of female sexual magical energy that you're talking about yeah 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 absolutely and i guess in terms of definition i guess there's other important aspects that i bring into it really again this is my very personal interpretation but um the whole um, experience of from the possession states and all the, the kind of um, experiences that I had working with with the energy um, just it's convinced me that she isn't just an archetype but she's a formula um, the word Babylon is a formula and she represents as an entity she kind of encapsulates a whole knowledge system rather than just kind of embodying the kind of ideas of sexual freedom and pushing boundaries in, in that direction she kind of crystallizes magical sexuality you know in a very very technical very visceral systematic way you know that, that can be developed in to a level that pro possibly has, has never been done before i mean we just can't know you know with it, there's so many gaps in history and specifically in women's history obviously there's always been powerful women and, and, and powerful female magic but the, as you say the, the way things evolve through history and on the perception of individuals and how they manifest through history. It seems like we're in a unique period now where certain aspects of, of, of magic and physicality can actually come together that haven't actually manifested before. So to me, she's that's what she's about. You know, she's a wisdom goddess that she's codifying, in a sense, some very technical magical processes that come through activating female occult anatomy which is has some specific aspects um, that haven't perhaps been acknowledged or researched to the, to the full extent or to, to the full potential so it's by pushing that research into female occult anatomy as well that we can start to codify this kind of what's been a kind of sublimated hidden female gnosis you know that's only just starting to be able to have the right conditions to be able to come through mm. No, I don't mean to ask if I, you know, so this is something you don't want to like talk about or address specifically, but um, I I'm, can only imagine the people listening are just dying to know specific details. Like we're, you're talking about complex uh, magical systems. Um, mm -hmm female occult anatomy and i'm sure people listening want to know details but uh, if i'm not mistaken a, what a lot of what you're discussing is um going to be revealed if you will in your upcoming book is that correct yeah that's absolutely correct yeah okay. yeah so i so i'm um, guessing you don't want to really address those things specifically right now in this conversation um well it's not that i wouldn't want to discuss it it's more that because there's such a lot of material, um, a lot of different um, aspects to the system, it'd be very difficult to try and condense it into anything that would make sense, really. I think you'd, what I, I cover in the book is a whole kind of process, a whole training system that that activates the occult anatomy of 156. So it's lots of very kind of technical ritual processes, learning trans techniques, specific trance techniques. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different aspects, facets to it. So to try and explain one bit doesn't really explain the whole. So um, right. but the best advice really is it would be just to read the book and, and from start to finish because I go through the whole process of activation and explore the whole um, anatomy of, of Babylon as I understand it, you know, in terms of that knowledge system. So and um, just to be clear, um because I think that's it, good to set people's expectations. The book and learning how to do this activation and, and working with this current would be something that'd be possible for people uh, without, 
you know, necessarily having you to consult with or perform some sort of hands-on initiatory process or anything. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, it's not the best. It's, it's a kind of poor substitute but to direct initiation into the current because that's that's the, the most um, accurate way mm-hmm. of understanding it, you know, which, which is why I kind of resisted writing about it for so long and I, I used other ways to try and communicate it. So um, I spent many years doing ritual performances um, where, in essence, it was a kind of I was constructing a group ritual and I was, I was attempting to create a group trance experience which I could convey all the different nuances of the current directly to people because it's much more easily understood in that way. Not that it's not possible to understand what, what I'm writing about, but it's that definite engagement, you know, that you, you get in it w- when you've got a shared energetic space when something's being physically conveyed in that way. Right. Um, it's completely different. So that's more ideal, but what I'm hoping is there's enough kind of basic threads in the book for people to follow and build their own practice and take off in their own directions and experiment with it. And it should hopefully be, be enough to activate the energies and then see what, see where it goes, you know, in terms of practice. Obviously, it's all in a very germinal state, you know, the, the one, five, six. This is something, you know, forms of knowledge, but haven't manifested fully it's still all out there it's still all being experimented with women are just starting to have the freedom a sense of freedom and integrating what's already been accomplished within the western magical tradition to try and to build kind of spaces to explore the more nuanced aspects of, of sexual magic so i think now is the time to be able to just put put this kind of information out and then I'll be waiting for feedback really just to see, you know, what people make of it to see if it's useful because obviously it's based on my own experiences. There's extracts from a magical diary. I've just broken down the whole process that I went through and I'm basically just putting it putting it out there for anyone else for whatever use it might be really, you know, just to because I I was on my own for so long and I didn't have any kind of guidance. So that might be useful, you know, to other people who are feeling like they haven't got any reference points to what they're experiencing. It might be of some use, you know. So that was the main motivation for oh, publishing, yeah. really. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly will be of great use. Uh, and I, it's tentatively titled The Marks of Test, is that correct? Yep, yep. But it, it will be entitled Marks of Test, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I know we're all anxiously awaiting that um, upcoming book and uh, I'm sure you're going to get uh, tremendous feedback Um, I can only imagine I hope so it's been an interesting process for me anyway to try and organize it all you know into in a a textual sense so yeah it's been that's been a challenge but it's been it's been interesting yeah, I mean, I can only imagine it's been to put your, you're really like putting yourself out there. You work, it's so personal and, uh, but yet, uh, I can only imagine, you know, the effects it will have probably, you know, dwarf any kind of, you know, discomfort or, um, vul- feelings of vulnerability. Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of got, got a lot of those feelings out of my system yeah. <laughs> quite, quite, quite early on with the, um, when I started off, when I was, I was having a lot of the very early, very intense experiences. Um, all the Kundalini phenomena were manifesting, and I was trying to make sense of it all. Um, it all started to settle into a kind of pattern after a while, and I started to be able to handle the energies a lot better. And I was looking for the formulas how to how to express the more what I would call pansexual aspects of the current. Mm-hmm. Um, the wider ways of communicating it that aren't necessarily focused on direct magical workings with another individual or in polarity workings. So I kept invoking Babylon and she just kept clicking back at me. She just kept saying, show me, show me. You know, so it was pretty terrifying, really, because <laughs> mm. it was really uh, hugely challenging the idea of trying to recreate what I'd experienced in my personal practice in any kind of public domain. Mm-hmm. The, the idea of going into 
you know, extreme states of trance and kind of and, or sexual arousal because it's a, a sexual trance state. So having to go into that really open, vulnerable state was really daunting. I had absolutely no idea how it would work in practice. So that was a real trip part, training part of the process. And that, that happened over about 10 years with the Mother Destruction Project. I had to learn to be comfortable in those states and um, being in that kind of liminal trance state where you're, it's half passive and, and half active. So you have, you're kind of in between mm-hmm. so that you can, you don't completely pass out um, and go into your own kind of energy that you, that you can actually handle it and use it and manipulate it and then communicate it as well. So it's technically quite difficult to handle as well as all the energies that you, that you feel when you're in a, a, a public space, a space with lots of other people there. So um, you're taking in other people's energies as well and you get this kind of group energy going. So that was a really big part of the training process. And that was that was really key because a big part of, ba- of the Babylon current is articulating this non-textual language. It's a visceral, physical, ecstatic, hieratic language mm-hmm. um, that's the basis of, an, of her knowledge system. So you have to become fully articulate in that and understand how to work with it and, and communicate it. So as I went on and I kind of got over my own inhibitions, you know, because you, you have to go through those one by one, just kind of letting them all go, you can find a way to, you can release yourself into it and a lot of the more kind of nuanced aspects of the trance then started to come through so it was a really useful process in terms of mapping out the whole I keep saying in this term knowledge system but it's this this non-textual language this physical ecstatic language mm-hmm. um, that was a really big part of it so once, once I'd been through that process then it was kind of integrating that into something again more nuanced. So it's been a really long, long process of kind of mapping out all these different parts of what feel to be uncharted territory in terms of female magic. Because again, there's very there's very little to go on when I started off. It's changing a lot right. now, and there's a lot more women who, you know, it's a real wave now of of, of women who are really starting to experiment with this. So. I'm really excited about that you know, to see what's, what the next developments will be. Yeah, I mean, I definitely feel like you're at the bleeding edge of this. Um, <laughs> yeah, it felt like that at times. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Can you describe how old Aeon magical models of femininity have permeated new Aeon philosophy and practice? What, the, the, what I can say is that there's, there's lots of levels to the, pro- the, the kind of problems that, that you find in terms of establishing a position as a woman and a magician in contemporary practices. Um, so some of the problems are based in wider historical biases that you find in religious and esoteric systems. But I've also had found real barriers um, in terms of problems that are very nuanced and specific to my own direction as a sex magical practitioner. So this is this, all these different levels of kind of barriers that you're constantly bumping up against when you're trying to make sense of how to orientate yourself, orientate your position, you know, of, of where you are and who you are and what you are, you know, in terms of what, the orthodoxy. So um, it's 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 very difficult. In terms of the one five six, the general problem was that there just didn't seem to be any established system that ascribed the kind of agency to women that I feel is really necessary for the one five six in terms of fulfilling its potential. So uh, you kind of on your own, you, know, you have to work from a, a kind of a heuristic practice where you have to go deeply into yourself, you know, to, to try and bring out the, the the authentic part of the practice. And again, as I keep saying, this is this is my own definition of the one five six, and others might not necessarily agree with it. In terms of the, the barriers, there's more in terms of old Aeon, new Aeon, we have to look at Salima. And a lot of pro- progress was made into Salima, included female aspects of divinity, had female participation in the OTO, but there were still some biases that made it difficult for me personally to relate to it fully. So I, it didn't really make sense for me to, to, to get involved with the OTO and any other kind of similar systems. The problem is, is that the system is it's a solar phallic mm-hmm. 
religion. Um, it's focused around the, the idea of the 93 current and the manifestation of, of Horus as the sun. Um, and so, oh, S-O-N. <laughs> so the alternative concepts of like the role of the daughter, if you want to look at the kind of um, metaphysical structures of the tetragrammaton, or all these kind of, the kind of Western models that inform all these systems, the, the, the emphasis is on the son and not the daughter, and there isn't a concept for the role of the daughter as having an aeonic function, which gives women their own independent agency, and aspects of magical will aren't fully considered. So, although it seems strange because my work is completely bound up with with Crowley, you know, that's, that's inescapable and he was hugely influential. There are just some aspects of Salima that just made it really difficult for me to, as a, as a magician to engage with. And then you have subsequently female occultists um, such as Nima and Hadna. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she, she did incredibly important work defining magical formulas that went beyond the 93 current and extending this into, into systems that balances many of the, the emissions that I felt were in, in Thelema. So that was really important. But again, the problem that I had was that my own work was pointing in the direction of a, a system specific to Babylon that was wholly concerned with sex magic. And so I, I just couldn't find any other models, basically, that were that seemed to have the technically fitted for the kind of ideas about female adepthood that I, I feel were necessary to, to kind of balance out all the earlier formulas. So it's been difficult trying to find context for it all. The initiatic imperative of the feminine sexual gnosis is really clearly identified with Babylon's magic in the Daughter of Fortitude. Mm-hmm. Um, in in these in these diaries, and she declares, "I sanctify, and I'm not sanctified." Mm-hmm. She's making a very clear statement of her magical agency. And that was, you know, how many hundred years of years ago? Mm-hmm. Um, that that was that was being resounded loudly through the ethers. But the technical means to fully embody that position that she was putting across there hasn't really been identified in the, in the primary sources of the current in Salima and in other strands, post polemic strands that that followed after that. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been it's been it's been a difficult process, you know, of kind of deconstructing things and and putting them back together in different ways to to make sense of it all. It does feel like uh opening up a window into into that huge potential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, well, to go back to more general biases. Mm-hmm. I think in many ways we're still dealing with a hangover from thousands of years of biblical prescription against women and sexuality. And the, the historical narrative of the feminine signifying passivity, absence, or only seen in relationship to the male. And this has been a factor which has left the nature of femininity in it with a kind of ambiguous status. And in essence, that's meant that it's the substance of femininity hasn't been fully explored because it's 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 very simplistic, but it's it isn't considered to have any agency in its own right. Mm-hmm. But this is this is the overall narrative that's influenced the Western magical tradition, which is wholly based on androcentric philosophical and religious traditions, which the whole overarching ontological narrative tends to diminish the position of women to a greater or a lesser extent. So you've got the biblical concept of the fall, which is hugely influential on how women are perceived in religious traditions. And then you've got the position of women in Western philosophical textual traditions in which they're largely defined as inferior or lacking in active qualities. And this comes from the inception, again, of the Western philosophical tradition, where men are synonymous with the idos, or idea, where the perfection is seen to be residing in the mind, and with the logos, analogous with the sperm as the life-carrying principle, and the ideas of reason, and the mind are seen as male qualities, and superior to the body. And then women are placed in polarity with this concept, of the idos as being synonymous with matter and 
definitively passive in relation to the logos or this male activating principle. So here you start to get to the sources of this kind of dichotomy between spirit and, and matter that kind of cuts a big schism through how men and women relate to each other in essence. And Plato saw matter as an imperfect version of the idea. Yes. And the body is a prison of the soul. Mm -hmm. So you have this inherent somatophobia, in essence, in the philosophical tradition, religions. Right. And clearly see it in like, religion, religious traditions such as Gnosticism, which the flesh is considered inherently impure because of its temporality and its sensuality and has to be rescued by various means, some of which are, are sexual. That's right. Yeah. As you know, <laughs> sure you know, but it's still, all of the sexual aspects of Gnosticism are still based on this idea of rescuing matter, seems to be, or the female, um, retrieving the female elements, you know, of, of the Sophia or the other kind of Gnostic goddesses right. so it's still coming from this position of you know something that's inferior that needs to be changed you know this is what we're sowing i think this, this dichotomy of flesh and spirit and the dots in the magical tradition that leaves us with the goddess and the great mother as a shapeless vessel or a receptive void which the male principle then imbues with characteristics and these the kind of ba these binary qualities then extended to gender roles and the moral attributions that are given to the sexes as well. So it's uh, what I would say just in a nutshell that is if you're working with sex magic with all that weight of history, it becomes sexuality and sex magic becomes a very complex battleground because you have to differentiate between sex as a primal force and sexuality as a mechanism of what I would call biopolitical control, mm -hmm. you know, a social construction. So feminism has challenged many of these biases, symbolic archetypes, but these are still really embedded in esoteric traditions, and many of them are just look completely built on it, so and they're really powerful, so it keeps reinforcing a lot of the biases and prejudices, and there's a whole minefield of all these negotiating all the semantics of magical symbolism, which creates characteristics and attributions for women, you know, which places passive, receptive mm -hmm. beings. In that framework, women can't participate as magicians because they don't possess the eidos or logos or the active creative force. And obviously we do, mm -hmm. everybody does, but you know, this is the kind of weight of um, bias that, that you're constantly trying to negotiate in lots of different, different ways. This is interesting. I guess uh, I'm curious, you know, how you you view this, I mean, I, you know, it's possible, like, I guess you could see this as, uh, like you said, kind of baked into the symbolism, so it's carried forward. But I, I have to think at some point, you know, when these things were originated by the ancient sages of old, that uh, they kind of understood that, you know, we're, we're giving people symbols here, and, and hopefully they're going to, you know, see beyond the symbolism but then again, you know, sometimes the uh, the way the the symbols, you know, kind of describing a reality or a uh, a reality to be, in a in a sense, in, when it says people work with it so much, I, it's hard to really get a handle for me on um, what I guess I'm trying to say is, did the system engender this kind of uh, bias? itself yeah, yeah. or or was the people creating the system already had that in mind and therefore embedded it in there i don't know that we uh, can know that for sure but i'm just yeah, curious no, absolutely i mean there's a, obviously a lot of factors historical factors went into creating the biases um probably a lot a lot to do with how people actually perceived that the biological functions of, of male and female and it wasn't you know properly known, you know, the, the, the physiological um, functionality, you know, so a, a lot of that came through, you know, people's perceptions of how um, reproduction and all the, the attributions to to the reproductive force um, mm -hmm. developed. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying it was, it was, it's been this deliberate kind of biopolitical agenda against women, you know, but I mean, there have definitely been those aspects, I think, in more recent history, but... Oh, yeah. Um, but the archaic sources, yeah, I'm not, you know, it, it's hard to know, but, you know, it's 
I'm sure. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, there was, wasn't, it, it evolved very naturally over time how all these perceptions um, came into being. But Would you discuss the uh, sociological and political reform that's implicit in the archetype of Babylon? I think we've touched on this a little already, but um, I, there's so much there, I feel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, my sense is that, or well, my experience of, of kind of esoteric seen over the years has been that there's a prevalence of kind of immaturity and misogyny mm-hmm. that that promotes very kind of reductive ideas about women and sexuality. And this has really distracted from what I think is sort of the main object, which is formulating and manifesting the knowledge system and these, these new types of, of sexuality. So in terms of sociological and political reform, I guess my own stance is probably considered extremely utopian and, and unrealistic, but it's... I don't think it's a naive utopianism. It's just rather I've just decided that there isn't really any point in compromising at the moment. There isn't really really the sense of long game in terms of people, human evolution now. So mm. might as well try and embody the most fiercely uncompromising vision um, about what's possible mm-hmm. to achieve. So I've, what I've tried to do in my own work is just to set out the perspective of a female magician and about what I feel needs to be done and what I genuinely believe is attainable in terms of magical practice. Going back to the sort of schism, you know, in, in terms of between the sexes and old day on perspectives and new aim uh, perspectives, a lot of it can be boiled down to, to a breakage between mind and materiality, human sentience and, and the ecosystem. It's like a really big disconnect between the physical and and the mind, you know, mm-hmm. and I think um, this is a huge part of, of you know, we're, we're reaping all the consequences of that now, that, that massive disconnect. Mm-hmm. And I, my my feeling is that the 156 represents a spark of, of hope that might just start to give some impetus, some kind of rebalancing that maybe at the last minute might help restore some, again, restore some balance. And I guess this ties into the kind of eschatological ideas about the 156 and, and, and Babylon and the end times. That's another whole area. But to speak in more general terms, again, about the, the, the reform, is a vastly powerful energy that's been suppressed in one half of the planet's population starts to manifest this magical potential. It's really hard. You can't really predict what impact it's going to have. You can only talk about what you will hope mm-hmm. would happen. Um, so... It's it, it's really difficult to say. I can only talk about what the sense. There's a vast sense of potential there. I'm going to do my best to try and manifest it. And I'm, I know there's lots of other women and other devotees of Babylon out there all all doing the same. Mm-hmm. And who knows? I think we haven't got anything to lose. We, we, we should just go for it, basically, at the moment, um, and just put it out there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with pretty much everything you just said in terms of that, and and rebalancing uh, e- the whole idea of an equilibrium and uh you, you know certainly what if it's a philosophical systems or general ways of functioning in the world but um they brought us to this crisis point i feel like and and i think you're right that you know maybe our best hope is to <laughs> try to rebalance things yeah yeah absolutely and again this is where i feel personally that i'm kind of going against the grain of everything that's kind of going on in in human culture at the moment in terms of the way humanity seems to be moving towards virtual consciousness Mm -hmm. and away from embodiment and and physicality but i just it makes me kind of panic because I feel that this transition has been so fast that the humans seem to be just adopting this virtual consciousness so quickly. The transition's been so fast. Women who've only just sort of began to have some relative freedom in, in the West, at least, there's, there's this sense that we've got this potential to develop, to develop within the body. And it's not going to have the chance to, to work through, you know, to actually 
actually have some impact to make any changes because this this shift towards the, um, the virtuality has become so extreme and people have just adopted it. You know, you've got this kind of phenomenon of, uh, in, in the worst aspects of it, what seems to be just kind of digital trance, you know, with everybody plugged mm-hmm. into devices and, compl- you know, like lemmings going over a cliff, yes. unaware of, of, of what's actually going on. And I feel like the antidote to that is is to go back to the body, but aspects of the body that haven't been fully explored. There's so much territory that hasn't been explored, and especially within sexuality. So I just feel it's really premature to kind of, although it's very exciting and interesting, you know, the way technology is evolving, and I find it just as interesting and as anybody else um, in terms of its creative possibilities and, and potential. But I feel that we just can't lose the body at this point. We have to be able to keep hold on to it and keep experimenting with it and then connect that with the virtual and then I think we have more chance of creating something much more balanced. Oh, I completely agree. I mean, I'm all in favor of that. That's why when we're, we're using technology right now to, to reach people, to, to tell them, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, go into the body. <laughs> don't go, don't flee out of the body. Go into it. The mysteries are endless. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, there, there, there's a lot I could talk about. Um, maybe it will come in a bit later in, in the later questions. Um, just this idea of, yeah, I, I'll keep going back to the body again and again because it's it's key. You know, it's interesting, too. There's, a, there's another whole aspect of this, um, which I apologize if this is coming. It's like too much of a tangent here, but... Um, Babylon, uh, I feel like, and in your work and the descriptions is in, in some respects, a little bit subversive. I, you could say, um, you know, trying to upset the established order. Um, yeah. and I very much see that Western esotericism is, uh, you know, there's always the this sort of like lip service to the goddess and the sacred feminine, um, maybe more than lip service in some traditions, certainly. But um, I see a, a sort of a, an analogy between the subversiveness of Babylon and the subversiveness of Western esotericism in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, their connection to the feminine in the face of I don't know patriarchy or the established yeah, uh, yeah. religion. I'm wondering if you if that comes through at all as well. Yeah, it it, it really does. But it's for me the, the kind of subversive aspects of Babylon are not the most obvious mm-hmm. that most people pick up on. Um, and I think a lot of the common perception of Babylon can be very reductive, very um, kind of cliched. Um, that's based a lot on quite cliched ideas of, of sexuality and ego project, projections and glamours um, because she, she, she has a very glamorous image yeah. um, so it's easy to get, get caught up in all of that um, and obviously in previous times there's a lot more taboo around sexuality so there was that sense of you know subversion about around sexuality but I don't really I think because society has become so hugely sexualized now in the media that's kind of lost a lot of its subversive power you know mm-hmm. and I, I think that's quite a good thing because I think once people get over that kind of initial feeling of um, discomfort or you know trying to be transgressive um, through sexuality and just reaching a state of what Wright called the kind of sexual economy, you know, of, of in- integrating sexuality and it flowing in um, a really healthy, natural way, then that kind of takes you to a next level, really, of what, what Babylon's really... Cause you kind of have to get that out of your system. I think that's just a bit of a, a blind spot mm-hmm. because because there's a much deeper sexual mysterium right at the core of Babylon that's much more complex, much deeper, and it's not about all this kind of superficial glamours. So... That, and that is the much more deeply um, subversive aspect to me because it's wholly to me about women starting to set a sexual agenda 
for magical magical formulas and, and magical traditions and actually starting to formulate a priestesshood um, which will start to develop ideas about how sexuality can evolve for women but everybody you know through through women having the ability to do that will then have a much wider influence on humanity in general and the planetary intelligences as well so for me that's a real deep subversive part because women have never had the chance to actually engage at that level and really direct that force so you know all the, all, as I say all the superficial glamours that's just a distraction it's not the important part of it at all it's there's, there's much more um, you know at the core of the current and I think that's a lot of people that, that's what many will actually resist as well because it's such a huge transformation that will bring about that that's that's going to be that's what I'm waiting to see you know to see if it actually some of that can actually manifest that the current will actually come through and create those bigger much deeper changes well, I think so I, I mean if certainly if you know if it's been actively working since the renaissance I think uh yeah, I mean, certainly we're talking about large time scales relative to, yeah. to our yeah. lifetime, but yeah. it certainly seems to be heading unquestionably in that direction with a tremendous amount of momentum. I don't. There's no no stopping it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I hope I hope so. No, I, it's because it's it will be an incredibly powerful and beautiful thing. You know, if it can if it can start to manifest. You know. Um, that's what I've spent my life trying to give my energy to, you know, and mm-hmm. focus to and, and share. So, And uh, lots of people are as well. Other people are. So I think it's been, it's been premature in many ways. Like during the 20th century, there have been many pronouncements of the imminent arrival of Babylon and the manifestation of the current. Um, but... My feeling is that it's actually really only starting to happen now. I've only felt in the last maybe 10 years or so mm-hmm. that it actually feels like it's really starting to come through. And I think that's that's largely because it's women now who are actively starting to define what she actually means and represents for them and the influence that she has on their lives and their magical work. So that, I think that's been pivotal in changing the whole thing because before that it was pretty much um, male occultists who were defining what Babylon was and with the greatest respect obviously you know anyone you know, there's, there's no there's no barrier to, to, to being a devotee of Babylon so it's, it's completely open to all so everyone can you know express what they feel about it obviously but it's been women have, have been held back in many ways and it's now is the time when they're, they're really starting to actually articulate it much more powerfully and strongly um, and to me, that's been a real turning point now that something much more tangible and deeper is actually starting to happen you know, in terms of the 156. Yeah, that's fascinating. Thank you so much, Amadali. I really appreciate you taking the time to share so much with us. And it's really an honor to talk with you. Um, I've been following your work for so many years, and um, it's really blessing just to have this opportunity so um i want you to know how much i appreciate it and appreciate you um you know sharing with us because i I understand it's not as easy uh as it might be for everybody to do thank you greg and it's been an absolute pleasure um talking to you and uh been a big fan of a call of personality for a long time so it's an honor for me to be finally included amongst all the um the other fantastic interviews so Thank you, and very much. And I would just also like to to, to mention. Um, I'd just like to give a big thanks to Three Hands Press for the, for being so supportive of, of my work, and would ask anyone interested in the Babylon Current to um, check out the the Three Hands the A Rose Veiled in Black because it's, it has a fantastic collection of essays by a whole spectrum of highly respected academics and practitioners and it's a real benchmark publication so um, there's a lot um, of very valuable material in the anthology in the occult of personality membership section you'll find the second half of the interview with Amidali featuring extensive exploration of the 156 system its historical influences and its implications 
Don't miss that excellent, exclusive recording. Just go to occultofpersonality.net slash membership and sign up if you haven't already. It's the best way to support the podcast while receiving access to a tremendous amount of additional exclusive content. Thanks again for listening, and until next time.